how did cognitive psychology emerge? In this video, we'll cover some of the major philosophical and historical antecedents that led to the rise of what has been called the cognitive revolution. Studies on the faculties of the mind date back thousands of years, consisting of numerous ways of categorizing and organizing them. One such approach can be summarized as the tripartite view of the mind. In other words, the mind can be divided into three major parts. For Plato, this included intellect, which pertains to thinking and reason, spirit, which pertains to the passions or emotions, and finally the appetitive function, referring to bodily desires. However, for cognitive psychology, one of the most directly influential theories is provided by the German philosopher Immanuel Kant, whose transcendental method helped him discover specific categories of the mind. In the standard telling of the story, Kant credited the philosopher David Hume for having awoken him from his dogmatic slumber. Hume employed a skeptical approach to knowledge, claiming that ideas such as causality and morality are not objective truths, but are rather subjective illusions of our perceptions. Perhaps useful, but illusions nonetheless. So for example, you can never see a cause. You can only see two subsequent events happen in a sequence. And if they happen enough times, you make the logical leap that the earlier event caused the later event. Hume was coming out of a tradition that placed heavy emphasis on experience being the primary source of knowledge of our world. The scientific method was founded on the idea that one can discern causes from experience. If causes are illusory, then the foundations of science become baseless. While there were other responses to Hume that addressed his skepticism differently, Kant was deeply disturbed by this insight and eventually developed his own method that sought to reestablish confidence in the scientific method, primarily by demonstrating the logical necessity of causality in experience. To do this, he turned to experience and asked a fundamental question. What is the condition of possibility for such an experience? In other words, in order to have the experience I'm having right now, what must the mind contribute over and beyond direct, raw sensory data in order to have that experience? Through this line of questioning, he identified certain universal and necessary categories of the mind. These categories function like schemata or mental representations that filter and shape sensory data in a particular way. These provide us a, certain, a, a kind of certainty concerning our knowledge of the world. The consequence of this philosophy is that it located truth in the mind, even though experience is necessary for such truth to be actualized. While the specific categories developed by Kant have not translated well to the cognitive abilities found in modern cognitive psychology, the transcendental method remains influential. If you recall in the last video, I discussed how the science of cognition uses behavioral measurements such as accuracy and response time. Uh, and from these direct empirical observations, cognitive scientists can infer the invisible underlying mental abilities that explain empirical observations. Such an approach shares similarities with Kant's transcendental method in the sense that it works backwards from observation to those mental categories that seem to explain those observations. Let's now turn to the early history of modern psychology, beginning in the late 19th century in Germany with the work of Wilhelm Wundt, who's generally considered to be the first to establish a research lab for conducting psychological experiments. Wundt rejected Kant's assumption that cognitive categories can only be arrived at through philosophical analysis. Instead, Wundt employed the method of trained self-observation or introspection. And along with his student, Edward Titchener, they systematically observed basic elements of the mind, such as sensations, images, and emotions, as well as their respective properties, such as quality, intensity, duration, size, and clarity. 
around the same time and shortly thereafter, another famous theorist proposed his own model of the mind. Whereas Wundt was largely concerned with the conscious mental experience, Sigmund Freud placed unique attention on active unconscious processes. These unconscious processes were not simply neutral storage places of mental representations, but served as organized, motivated impulses, as well as stored but repressed memories that together shaped the personality and behavior of individuals. Both Wundt's introspectionism and Freud's psychoanalysis received notable criticism from the scientific community. However, rather than propose another methodology for examining mental processes, some researchers proposed that the concept of the mind be removed altogether, and instead, focus would be placed on behavior and the objective environment that shapes behavior. These behaviorists draw influence from two notable sources. First, Ivan Pavlov's research on the salivating reflex in dogs that led to the development of classical conditioning. The central idea of classical conditioning is that behaviors are learned through association. For example, a baseball player who hits a home run while wearing a particular pair of socks may come to associate wearing those socks with the home run and so continue wearing them. A second major influence came from Edward Thorndike's Law of Effect what later became called operant conditioning. The basic idea here is that behaviors are learned based on the rewards and punishments that follow those behaviors. Combining classical and operant conditioning, behaviors operated under the fundamental assumption that if you can control the environment, you can gradually shape behavior. On the one hand, this highly deterministic and reductionistic model seemed to remove the humanity of psychology. But on the other hand, it contained a kernel of liberation as it proposed that people are not determined by genetics, but are capable of change. Social policies and political interventions can, then can be used to create greater equality in society. As mentioned in the previous video, numerous anomalies and contradictions uh, gradually accumulated that made behaviorism an incomplete explanation for human behavior. One such contradiction already mentioned is language. A second major contradiction came from studying wounded soldiers from war. It was observed that individuals with head trauma were demonstrating unusual kinds of behavioral impairments that could not be explained by the environment alone. These early neuropsychologists began to draw connections between the loss of certain mental abilities and the areas of damaged brain tissue. A third major contradiction arose not by studying humans, but from computer science. The emergence of the computer in the second half of the 20th century provided an alternate metaphor for studying the mind, giving rise to information processing theory. In comparing the human mind to a computer, scientists began to conceive of the mind as basic processes that computed information through a series of sequential steps. The mind receives input from the external environment, retains it for short usage, much like RAM, ran, uh, random access memory, and deploys a central processor that uses that stored input to execute a command, which finally gets expressed as an output. While the information processing theory has received criticism in recent years, finding competition from parallel processing and neural network models. It continues to be a useful way of thinking about cognition and will be the primary model discussed in this course. And as such, we can present the different cognitive abilities as a series of sequential steps. We begin with perception, whereby various qualities of our experience are processed, such as color, shape, motion, and depth. Attention then follows to focus on specific information within our perceptions and helps to create a unified experience of bringing together color, shape, and motion into a single object. This integrated object can then be compared with our previously stored mental models, which have been derived from long-term memory and allow us to recognize what we're seeing. As we perceive, attend to, and recognize information, we hold on to it for a short period of time in working memory. This allows us to actively think about this information as long as it stays in this short-term storage. 
holding information in working memory then facilitates the process of storing new information in long-term memory. Information stored in long-term memory gradually leads to mental representations. At the most advanced level, the use of these mental representations allows us to make judgments, decisions, and to engage in problem solving. This description is an oversimplification, but useful as a kind of a beginning model for thinking about the functions and relations among different cognitive abilities. Each of these cognitive abilities are associated with brain activity, from chemical messages sent by individual brain cells, all the way to interconnected brain networks that coordinate several brain regions. Before ending today, I would like to address one last question. Is cognitive psychology biased in the way it conceives of the mind? I'll mention one major potential bias. As with much of modern psychology, there is the influence of individualism. Individualism here means treating the human mind as distinct and relatively separate from other minds, as well as the larger social environment. The mind is buffered from the external world encapsulated in a bag of skin and bones and lacking a kind of porousness that we see in other conceptions of the mind, particularly conceptions that we see throughout history and culture. Indeed, cognitive psychology does consider social interaction to be highly influential in shaping the mind, but such influences are treated as distinct, each being defined as a set of separate variables. Does it make sense to treat the mind in this way? Um, does this not lead to some mystification by treating fundamentally unified processes as if they were separate? Is it not like treating lightning and thunder as if they were isolated sequential events, leading to a misguided question as to how the lightning causes the thunder when in fact they're a unified phenomenon? These questions won't be settled here, but what I can say is that cognitive psychology's conception of the mind is not universally accepted. Indeed, in different cultures, religions, and philosophical traditions, the mind's considered uh, fundamentally inextricable from the social context. And such a conception would return us to the notion of cognition as a form of social knowledge, as a knowing together mentioned in the end of the last video. It also offers an alternate response to David Hume's criticism of causality. Perhaps the issue is not so much that causality is a useful illusion, but rather that the con concept of causality mistakenly presents the world as a set of separate objects that at times interact with each other in some fashion. This view, which is not universally held, has been undoubtedly beneficial to allowing us to develop knowledge and technology that have improved the human condition. At the same time, it may perhaps lead to a failure to recognize our fundamental interconnectedness with others and our environment. We could wonder how the crises facing our world presently may at least partly be attributed to this individualism that we see manifested in cognitive psychology. If you like this video and want to see more, please subscribe to this channel. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.